Okay, perfect. Well, just to introduce myself, um, just really briefly, my name is Morgan Haddon, and I'm the program coordinator at a nonprofit called Get Healthy Utah. Um, I think anyone who registered for this webinar or is here today um, is probably pretty familiar with what we do. Um, but I did just want to start out with a couple of uh, announcements and friendly reminders. Um, so, of course, here at Get Healthy Utah, we do the Healthy Utah Community designation, where cities and towns across the state can um, apply to get designated a Healthy Utah community. Um, just as a reminder for those who are here, um, we do have our next application deadline coming up uh, pretty soon, this spring, March 1st. Um, so just wanted to send out that reminder that if your community is working on that designation to make sure that uh, you reach out to Get Healthy Utah, send us an email, ask us for the fillable application, and then be sure to get that filled out and sent back to us again before March 1st. And uh, the award ceremony will take place at the Utah League of Cities and Towns uh, conference, which will take place in April. Um, so with that, we are really excited to go ahead and just jump right into the webinar. Um, we are very lucky to have Sean Tigan here with us, who is the president of the Utah Foundation. Um, so before we turn the time over to him, I just wanted to give uh, kind of a, a brief little background of, of who he is, why he's here, and what the topic is on today. Um, so Get Healthy Utah partnered with the Utah Foundation um, to help create a series of reports called the Healthy Communities Reports. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here for just a second to show you what we're talking about. Um, but the Utah Foundation is um, a really incredible organization that does some nonpartisan research just on best practices to improve the state of Utah. Um, if you come here to their website and click on research reports, um, you can see that they recently completed a series of three reports titled Healthy Communities. Um, the three reports address cultivating food access, um, advancing wellness and safety, and enhancing open space. Um, I'll go ahead and in the chat, I'll drop the link to this so that all of you can come here and check out the, the reports on your own time. Um, they are pretty, I mean, they're reports, right? So they're each about 20 pages long, go into a lot of uh, great detail and information on what cities and towns can do to improve um, health in their communities. So if you want to take the time, you can click here to download the full report. Um, but of course, we are lucky enough to have Sean here, who's going to do an overview of these reports for us. Um, so with that, Sean, I'm just going to go ahead and read your bio and then turn the time over to you, if that sounds good. Um, so as I mentioned, Sean Tigan is the president of the Utah Foundation. He has worked for the Utah Foundation for over a decade, researching a broad swath of public policy issues. He also teaches a public policy course at the University of Utah and has worked as a housing policy analyst, a consultant to early stage businesses, and the founder of an organization focused on foreign investment related economic development. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in management and a Master of Public Policy degree from the University of Utah. He serves as a board member for several public sector, private sector, and nonprofit organizations. And Sean has always been active in volunteering, including having spent two years in Kazakhstan with the U.S. Peace Corps, um, which is pretty impressive. Um, so Sean, with that, if you just want to go ahead and, and take over and jump right into your presentation, um, just so you guys know, at the end of the presentation, we'll have a Q&A. So if you want to hold your questions until the end and also Get Healthy Utah, we'll, we'll do um, kind of a brief introduction to some upcoming events that we have to go over some of these reports in more detail, um, including a roadshow and Connected Community Summit, but we'll provide the details at the end. So Sean, go ahead and take it away. Perfect. And if you could give me screen sharing capabilities, that'd be awesome. I've got a lot of slides here, but if I uh, didn't have the slides to keep me on track, I would be presenting all day long, I think. There we go. That worked. All right. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Morgan, for the introduction there. I was going to tell you a little bit more about the Utah Foundation, but I think you did a great job. So I'm just going to skip right that, uh, just jump right on into it. Uh, so today, I'm essentially going to be talking about improving quality of life through three areas. And those, as Morgan mentioned, one of them is open space, uh, one of them is wellness and safety, and one of them is food accessibility. And the reason why we talked about improving quality of life is because that's part of the vision of the Utah Foundation is, is to, is to uh, provide a, a kind of a foundation for better, higher quality of life in Utah. But one of the things we find in terms of some of our work, 
um, like our community and, and personal quality of life surveys, is that these sorts of issues like open space, wellness and safety and food accessibility are super important uh, to people and, and they'd be better off if, if, uh, they, uh, if their needs were met in these areas. So why do we talk about this stuff at all? We talk about it because of the benefits. Uh, so we, we talk about, uh, you know, in these reports, the benefits of physical activity and, and how they relate to these activities, uh, social connectedness and how that relates to open space and parks and public spaces, um, health equity in general. We talk about access to safe transportation and public space. And then uh, we also talk about access and affordability to, to healthy food and really the benefits of all of these things in terms of, you know, quality of life, but also our overall mental and physical health and, and otherwise. So as Morgan mentioned, this health community series, um, these are the three reports uh, with these kind of funky design uh, covers. I, I, I'm kind of excited about those covers, actually. I like, I like these uh, stylistically. Uh, but, but in terms of the first one, enhancing open space. So first of all, I think it's important to understand, like, what are we even talking about? What the heck is open space in general? And like, if, if you ask somebody on the road, they would be like, well, open space, I guess, like at the mountain or something? Is that what we mean? So really what we talk about uh, in these re reports are we talk about these large regional parks. So uh, in Salt Lake City, for instance, we've got uh, Liberty Park, uh, uh, but but also smaller uh, neighborhood parks that you might see, uh, you know, just down the street that are maybe, you know, just a square block or even smaller. Uh, so we also talk about golf courses and dog parks. So golf courses, you know, very large golf courses that you might find, uh, 18 holes in, in Washington County, uh, and then dog parks uh, that you might find, particularly in more urban areas uh, around the around the state. We talk about nearby mountain ranges, uh, we talk about deserts, uh, and then trails uh, we come up in these open space reports. We talk about schools and churchyards, urban plazas, road medians, which may be kind of crazy to people, but you know, if there's a little bit of space on a road median and, and you've got some fruit trees or something there, that's kind of what we're talking about. And, and somebody brings a lawn chair out and watches the traffic go by or whatever. So that's just a, a, an example of some of the things uh, in these reports. Uh, uh, in terms of that open space, oh, you know, actually I should go back one of the things that I think that is, is pretty interesting in terms of uh, Wasatch Front Regional Council in their Wasatch Choice vision, they talk about this open space, these types of amenities um, as parks and public spaces. That's a new kind of their new nomenclature for, for thinking about these. And it's just convenient areas where people gather and recreate and whatnot. So in terms of obstacles, uh, there are in, in, in the first report, we talk about some of the obstacles, first of all, being historical population growth. So one obstacle is that you know, over the past you know, 40 years, we've seen the population, particularly in many urban and suburban, suburban places, really explode in Utah. Uh, it's also future population growth. So we're expected to see uh, growth continue and we're going to, you know, potentially have, uh, you know, double our population or, or so by, by 2060. And then we also uh, talk about spending on public parks and spaces. And, you know, we spend money on public parks and spaces. There's, you, know, you, you see bonds in communities around the, around the state and and uh, and other uh, general operating funds. And, and uh, but one thing that we point out in this report is that Utah's parks and recreation investments have not kept up with income. So we've actually seen, in terms of personal income, a decrease in spending on on parks and recreation, both at the United States, which is the bottom lighter blue line there, but on the, the top darker line, that's Utah, we've seen a de decrease over the years. And we've actually seen a bit of an increase in the past couple of years. And this week, we just look at 2019 and 2020, those fiscal years. Uh, we don't uh, have, I don't have the newer updated numbers. I think we 2021 is now available, but that's also kind of messed up from the pandemic. The fiscal year 2021 is messed up from the pandemic. There's so, um, uh, a so we've seen a decrease in, in spending in public parks. So, so I guess what do we do about it? What do we do about the, the fact that maybe we've got a lot of people and and uh, we've got a little bit less spending in parks? Well, maybe uh, one example. One, one solution we talk about in this is greening and repurposing uh, public spaces. So we'll get more into that in just a moment. We also talk about addressing overcrowding. Uh, we talk about transportation solutions. Uh, we talk about uh, trail expansion. So, and, and more. I mean, this report, all of these reports have a lot of kind of solutions that they touch on. 
Um, and, and we kind of think of almost like a handbook for communities to kind of look at some of the things that are out there to take a look at. Um, so in terms of greening or and or repurposing public spaces, uh, one of the things we talk about is, is community schoolyards. So, uh, you know, thinking of, of existing community schoolyards as kind of a shared use where you might be able to, uh, you know, fill these spaces up after school, after school is let out with other kind of activities. Maybe you get uh, uh, intramural uh, 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 soccer teams and, and recreational, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm thinking of what's, what's the little thing with the little Batman. Bat, bat, I don't know why Batman popped in my mind. I couldn't even get the word out. Uh, but making sure that we're using existing green spaces to the best of our ability. We also uh, talk about golf courses. And this is in terms of, of using some of the wild areas of golf courses for trails or other activities, but also things like, you know, it's, it's snowing uh, where I'm at today, um, using some of these golf courses for cross-country skiing and other things uh, when when uh, the golf uh, season is maybe not in full swing, uh, excuse the pun, um, and infill opportunities. So we're looking at, you know, governments have a lot of leverage in terms of what comes into communities. And when you've got a space that maybe is a a uh, brownfield space or or a space in a, in a community that was more industrial before maybe is being a little bit developed and those governments can can uh, um, uh, twist the arms of some developers uh, governments can twist the arms to to make sure that there's some green space and and available and, and, and open space for people in those communities so in terms of addressing overcrowding uh, we can think of this as pay to play like you know as a national park you, you pay to get in uh to uh, uh to to uh, a national park land if you're going to zions or something and there's also congestion pricing so maybe uh to get up a canyon uh you charge a little bit more uh, to get up the canyon or you charge you start charging um when there's a lot of people up there already so uh, we also talk about transportation solutions and this is uh, probably more for for more quite a bit high more high traffic areas like shuttles and then transit expansion in, in the limited number of places that have transit in, in utah and then trails so we've got some great trail networks and one of the trail networks we talk about is in the ochre mountains uh that that uh are between twila and salt lake county uh there's a lot of new trails going in uh, and into that area and that's a, a, a public and uh private kind of partnerships to put those trails into place, but then we also talk about the state money and the governor, uh, Governor Cox, and the and the Utah Legislature is putting a ton of money into uh, supporting trails across the state. So this is pretty exciting. This is forty five million dollars a year ongoing that we're going to see a lot of connectivity in in communities across the state in years to come. And I really see that this is a transformational thing. We're going to look back at this if this still exists in twenty years from now. We're going to look back at all of the good that this has done in communities and really transform places across community in terms of recreational activity and and physical uh, fitness and, and whatnot. It's it's a, this is a, a huge deal. Um, so the second report, um, advancing wellness and safety. So to tie into the trails, we talk about trails here. And if we could just get people uh, moving out uh, outside in a safe way, you, you get a lot of benefits from it. So and and um, uh, one of the things we talk about as part of this is that is is that not everybody is close to a uh, uh, a park or a trail. So we've got about fifty five percent of Utah residents that live within ten minutes a ten minute walk uh, to a park. This figure here, these are all larger communities, so like 30,000 30, residents or above. Uh, but you go from Salt Lake City, American Fork, and Ogden on the on the left with a lot of people, a large percentage of people that have a, a close walk uh, to a park or a trail. Um, but then you you end up with um, some places like Layton and Holiday and, and Cedar City that, that aren't quite as close uh, to those amenities. And we actually have uh, a figure in the report uh, of all of the, and actually, I don't know which report it's in, it may be the first or the second, the open space or the uh, uh, wellness and safety that show uh, rural communities as well. And so we've got, a, a, I think, another 30 or 40 uh, communities that that uh, uh, we have this inventory of, of parks and, and and how far they are from people in, in those reports. So what do you do about it? So do we just add parks? Well, maybe that's the answer for some places. Maybe, you know, if there's room and if there's, there's the will to do it, maybe you add parks. But there's, there's, I think, more than that. There's increasing park usage and then community programming. And some of the things we talk about in terms of increasing park usage is, is to make them 
great so that people want to visit them. There was a park out, I, I brought up Tooele. I, I, I uh, was in Tooele uh, last year at one point and I, I went by a park that, um, it, you know, and this is, just, I don't know, I don't have any idea what the story was with this, but it was just a very overgrown thing with like lots of weeds and, and, and it was, it was kind of weird. It was, it was a little bit uh, uh, surprising to see that. And I can't imagine anybody going there. It was funny to see that some people were with their two dogs there and the dogs were having a, a crazy good time, but it also seemed like a lot of people probably wouldn't want to go uh, to just an over weedy um, uh, uh, kind of place, but also, you know, uh, people want to go to places that have uh, amenities like, you know, pickleball courts or uh, beautiful, you know, water features or something that you can, that are Instagrammable, I think is what they call it. But then there's also programming. One of the things we bring up in our report is a lot of the programming that Sandy City has done to get people into parks, a lot of community activities uh, to, to get people out, like uh, uh, people flying their, um, uh, their little drones, like having these big drone parties, but also having a bunch of food trucks come out and have like little parties around that, having balloon festivals and having and uh, 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 little bands play in the parks, all kinds of stuff like that. We talk about a ton of different things. There's also, we talk about safety on the road. And this figure, unfortunately, is not uh, showing a decrease in pedestrian bike deaths. What it is actually showing is the decrease in citations um, uh, between 2000 and 2022. So we've seen a decrease in citations. And we, I think, imply <laughs> to a certain extent that maybe uh, this decrease in citations, uh, you know, is in some way related to the increase in in pedestrian and bicycle deaths in in Utah. And so, you know, one of the, a couple things we bring up, and you know, that that would take a whole study on its own, and we didn't go into that study, but we looked at a couple places, and, and there are it's complicated, and and uh, you know, I. I uh, a whole paper could talk about things like the other possibilities in terms of what is increasing uh, pedestrian and bicycle deaths in, in the state. But one thing is, you know, people are speeding. We are finding that people, are, in fact, you know, 100 mile an hour cars being ticketed, it's, it's, it's way up. And, and there is enforcement on those that maybe not enforcement of people going, you know, uh, uh, 35 in a, in a 25 mile an hour zone. Funny thing though, my daughter just got a ticket about a month ago, and <laughs> I'm never going to let her uh, let that one down. I, I think it's I, I've talked about how nobody gets tickets anymore, and then my daughter gets a ticket. Um, but photo radar, we talk about things like that, just a whole bunch of different uh, kinds of activities like that. We talk about active transportation plans and just knowing where people are, you know, getting hit by cars in terms of pedestrian and and and. Um, uh, bicycle deaths and, and other uh, users of the roadway and to figure out how do we, you know, make those uh, places a little bit more amenable to uh, safe routes to parks and whatnot. Um, and then finally, hard infrastructure. This is a, a big thing we talk about in quite a few places in the report. What the heck does that mean? It just means, you know, we've got maybe some uh, bike lanes and we've got wide uh, 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 uh sorry, walkways for people. And, and we've got a uh, crossing, a nice crossing uh, across busy streets and, and uh, just the kind of amenities and lighting. I mean, the lighting is so important for so many places. Uh, and and if, if you don't have the lighting and you're crossing the street, you don't have reflective beer on, you know, you're, you're uh, uh, putting your life in your own hands in, in situations like that. So we talk about uh, complete streets quite a bit. And then finally, uh, this third report, uh, Cultivating Food Accessibility, uh, this too, you know, this is, uh, a, a, we tackle a broad range of, of items in this report and, and a whole host of different types of, of ways to ameliorate uh, certain issues. Uh, but to get to, to, to start off with, uh, we talk about food insecurity. And so this is just, I'll read this out here, a lack of consistent access to enough quality or desirable food for every person in the household to live an active and healthy lifestyle. So. Uh, having enough food to make sure that it's uh, it's consistent, you're consistently getting uh, good, high quality food. Hopefully, lots of fruits and vegetables. Hopefully, lots of low processed foods. Um, and what we find actually is that fewer people are food insecure, and and fewer people are very food insecure. This is both in Utah and in the U.S. over the past like 15 years. So we're, we're seeing um, some improvement there, which which is pretty exciting. Uh, uh, but, you know, that doesn't help people that are still food insecure. <laughs> so how do we benefit those folks? Well, there are some obstacles to this. You know, finances, 
uh, proximity to the full service grocery stores, lack of transportation, and the last two, you know, are, are pretty well tied together. Um, these are the obstacles, and but but the costs are high, and then the costs of food insecurity hurts the body in the bank. So um, you've got higher food insecure people have higher risks of obesity, of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, um, and they pay more. I mean. <laughs> because they have uh, more issues, but they pay more in annual medical uh, care. So there's they're they're not getting the the healthy food maybe that they need, and and, and that is um, tied with correlated with some of these poor health outcomes. And then of course they've got more uh, they've got more expenses in terms of medical care. So what are the solutions? Solutions we talk about in this report, you know, uh, uh, several different ones, but utilizing schools as community food centers. We talk about maximizing federally funded food programs. This is important because guess what? State doesn't have to pay for it. Local communities don't have to pay for it. If we can just use some state, local, private, uh, nonprofit uh, groups to help kind of um, uh, uh, get more people utilizing those federally funded food programs. Um, subsidize access to local fresh foods. Um, and then finally, uh, for the, this presentation at least, um, investing in community food projects, and those are big and small ones. So let me uh, get into each one of those one at a time here. So in terms of schools as community food centers, so one approach is increasing funding and um, increase funding and improve free uh, breakfast and lunch. Uh, um, so that improvement might be, that increased funding and that improvement uh, might be things for and related to, uh, you know, more kids having access to these free breakfast and lunch programs, but also having better food and better food options and, and having uh, uh, healthier options for uh, those kids. We also talk about operating on-site pantries uh, for families, for kids and their families, and then promoting this kind of on-campus nutrition and garden and farm programs. Um, so you see a lot of communities and, and schools across the state have little uh, have little you know gardens on the property. And maybe some of those uh, those garden programs are being used. Like you're you're having kids working in the garden. And some of those items are maybe being used in lunches um, as, as part of that connection um, between uh, you know the, the the garden and the uh, and the lunch that people are eating. It might get some people excited there. And you know there's well. I'm not going to go on a side on a tangent because I'm uh, only had so much time. Um, maximizing funds uh, from federal food programs. So in Utah, less than 80% of people eligible for SNAP currently receiving benefits, which is which is kind of crazy. Um, so one of the things we could do are increase the efficacy of SNAP with through this kind of re-enrolling people in these programs. Uh, that, that's a big deal, you know. We we talk also a lot about about uh, older Utahns and how uh, there's a there there are quite a deficit in terms of of the number of people that could be enrolled in in uh, programs for older Utah seniors um, across the state. Um, so we could also subsidize access to fresh local foods. So we could we could think about um, uh, food for seniors at farmers markets. Um, we talk about uh, the, the double up food programs. Uh, we talk about produce subscriptions and we talk about uh, low income CSA memberships. That's these community supported agriculture memberships. So is that something maybe a community uh, might help support to get more people enrolled in community supported agriculture? So they have more regularly have food in their own homes that's healthy. As a, as a side note, we have a, a, a CSA um, in my household and there are a lot of times, like I would never go to the store. Who goes to the store and buys bok choy? But we get bok choy every once in a while and it's awesome. I mean, it happens all the sun chokes. Never purchased sun choke in my life. Uh, we get a sun choke and we use this thing and it's like, this is an interesting vegetable and it's healthy and it's, it's uh, delicious and kind of unusual and, and, and something I can tell an anecdote about the presentation. Um, we also uh, uh, talk about investing in community food projects. Um, and these are big ones like food hubs. We talk about food hubs, which is essentially making sure that we can get food and and processed and distributed out to people across the state, use some of the food that's, that's grown nearby in, in Utah and nearby states and get it to people in a great way. One downside of this is that or one problem with this is that we actually don't produce much of the food that we eat uh, in Utah. Utah uh, farmers um, uh, don't produce a lot of 
what we need and what we need to eat in the state. So we do need a lot, of course, to bring in a lot of food from outside. Um, but then there's also um, some small projects that we talk about. And these are things like, uh, you know, just getting healthy options in front of people in markets and, and helping markets through that process, either with information or maybe with a little bit of a of, of financial incentive to get these healthy, um, healthy foods in front of people so that that's what they're buying and they're not just buying a snicks on the way up but snicks uh twix or snickers on the way up but maybe getting a banana um and and, and perhaps some, some dried fruit or something so anyway the last thing in terms of this health community series something that really ties this all together and we talk about this a little bit more extensively in one of the projects is something that that uh, get healthy utah also likes to talk about and that's this health and all policies framework like thinking about the stuff that we do in our communities, in our counties, and in our cities and towns. And whenever we build a road or whenever we allow for a building or whenever we think about a park or a trail, we're thinking about the ramifications of, of health in terms of physical activity and social connectedness and food accessibility and, and making sure that people are, are, uh, are, you know, we've got a community of, health, of healthy folks that, that, that then have higher quality of life than they, than they would otherwise. So in, in essence, in, in terms of the three things that we talked about in this report, it's, it's this improvement of quality of life through open space, uh, wellness and safety, and food access, uh, accessibility. And if you guys uh, uh, have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer those. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I just want to emphasize one of the things that here at Get Health Utah, we love about these reports is it so clearly lays out a roadmap of what our communities can do to improve health, right? It's, I hope you could tell as Sean was talking that all of the things outlined in this report are are very simple, very practical, um, very real life, um, and are things that can be applied no matter where you are across the state, right? So thank you so much for that. Um, we'll go ahead and just like Sean said, if anyone has any questions, we'll give you just a moment to either raise your hand, come off of mute, or drop those in the chat. And in fact, as people are thinking about questions, Sean, I might go ahead and start off with one of my own, if that's okay. Um, yeah, and for it's, it. it's kind of a two-pronged question. Um, so the question I wanted to start out with was, um, just out of all of the recommendations and policies that, you know, you outline in these reports, um, kind of the, the first prong of it is, are there any things that you identified that you feel like are really low hanging fruit, right? Like that it's kind of like, hey, this is a really good place to start. This is a simple change, simple policy that you can probably start doing right away. So kind of what's a low hanging fruit change? And then the second prong is even if it's a little bit of a heavier lift, are there any changes that you think would have a really dramatic effect on the health and well-being of Utahns across the state, right? So kind of like what's easy yeah. and then what's hard but really effective. You know, I think some of the easiest stuff is is I brought up uh, schools and we've, there's so much open space in schools around the state, a ton of schools in the state. And if we can more effectively use those spaces for the broader community, for the kids that are going to, to school there, but also the, the neighbors, um, I think that that's important. Um, it's also important to really uh, uh, use the existing parks at a higher rate and to to enhance the program, to, to make them make people want to go there because the spaces are either beautiful or super functional or um or you know fun in whatever way that is um but also uh bring people there so so I kind of uh, guide them there with with the, the kind of beauty of it but also get them there through um activities and programming and 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 just get people off their bums and out into the community a little bit so that that stuff i think it's it, it seems pretty easy uh in terms of of the harder lift things, I think that this this idea of a of a food hub I think is important. Um, Utah is you know it's it's in some ways kind of surprising that Utah doesn't have a food hub. We do have some pretty great kind of local food programming in the state that maybe isn't a replacement for that. But in terms of of, of getting perhaps the heavier lift, making sure that kids are eating and have access to healthy foods. So it's, if you can get healthy food into 
uh, into schools and onto people's plates and make sure that that anybody that needs to can can access that food um, um, at no cost. Uh, it, it's super important because it not only you know, it's helping and it's expensive. We have, like I said, we have a lot of kids here. It's expensive to make sure that we're, we're uh, putting healthy food on people's plates um, in every school around the state. But when there was a anecdote, um, you know, my, when my kid was, was really young, uh, there were a couple of times we, when we dropped her off at school early, early enough to do the uh, school breakfast program. And she told us what we, she ate for breakfast. And we we're just like, what? No, like, no, why? How is it that 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 breakfast is a little piece of French toast that you dip into into maple syrup and that's and, and orange juice and like I was just like this can't be what you ate this is can't be what is is available to me but but you know it it's it's what it is and and schools are on budgets and we're trying to we're trying to run schools and on really tight budgets the way it is and how much money are we going to put into to to food but it's a big deal in terms of health. And, and healthy habits and 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 uh, lifelong nutrition, but also in, in, in helping kids, uh, you know, be ready for, you know, learning, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and all that other stuff that they're supposed to be learning in schools. Awesome, that's fantastic. So that was, part of that was my soapbox. So I apologize for uh, <laughs> for that that extra uh, a little bit of information there. No, I think I think I speak for everyone where I say when I say there's no need to apologize for that because that's. That's great information. And what I like about that, too, is that would impact kind of the next generation, too, right? The heavier lifts, but that's making sure that Utah's on the right trajectory. Our kids are on the right trajectory to, to be healthy and, you know, for their whole life long. So awesome. I think so, thank so. Thanks. Thank you. Perfect. And does anyone else have any questions? I'll, I know the silence can be awkward, but I'll go ahead and open it up for about 20 seconds to see if anyone has um, a question to put in the chat or come off of mute. Silent treatment is not so, working, Morgan. And it's not working. I tried <laughs> to pressure them. <laughs> no, that's great. Well, we appreciate everyone who um, who came to listen to this presentation. Um, I hope you're able to realize just what a great resource these new reports are. And I hope all of you take the opportunity to maybe look them up on your own time and do kind of a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, so on top of that, too, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen um, because this webinar, of course, today was was meant to be a little bit of a brief overview of these reports, right? Like we could we could do a deep dive into each one of these, right? Like the, the food report, the physical activity report, and just talk for hours about each one of them. Um, so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about some some other events that that we have coming up that's going to talk about the same kind of content. Um, so Get Healthy Utah is partnering with the Utah Foundation this spring um, to do a Healthy Communities Roadshow. So what we're doing is we are actually hitting the road and going in person um, to each of the seven different AOG regions or jurisdictions around the state. So we're going to be going um, and hitting each of the seven AOG, so literally trying to, to reach every single county in the state. Um, and we're going to have a two-hour event um, that event is going to include lunch, of course, right? Um, some good food, but also we're going to have presentations from Get Healthy Utah, the Utah Foundation, and Guiding Our Growth Survey on what um, Utah communities can do to improve the health and wellness of, of all of our residents. Um, on top of those partner presentations, we're going to be doing some case studies of local success stories from each of the different regions that we're visiting. We're going to have facilitated discussions um, where you can network and talk with other people in your local area about um, challenges and successes that you're having with improving health and wellness, and then end with um, some roundtable discussions to do some collective problem solving. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I will drop the link to this flyer in the chat. We don't have the dates pegged down quite yet because there are going to be at least seven different events and we're still working with local AOGs to um, peg those uh, those dates and times down, but stay posted or stay tuned. We're going to be posting more information about the upcoming Roadshow in our newsletters, on our website, and just through our normal communication channels. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about, um, so that's going to be in the spring, probably around like end of February, beginning of March. Um, and then in the fall, in September, um, Get Healthy Utah, Move Utah, and Bike Utah are partnering 
together to do what we're calling a super summit, um, where for the first time in the state, we're going to be hosting a connected community summit, where we're going to talk, again, more in depth about what local cities and towns and communities can do to improve health and wellness. Um, so it is already open for registration. All you have to do is come to connectedcommunitysummit.com. Um, to learn some more about the event and to get registered. We do have early bird pricing going on um, for a pretty steep, steep discount right now. So, so the announcement here, you'll be one of the first if you want to go ahead and get registered. So like I said, I will go ahead and drop uh, those two things in the chat. Um, but again, thank you so much to everyone who took time out of your day to come um, and be part of this webinar. Um, and if you have any questions or want some additional information, you're always welcome to reach out to either me or Sean at the Utah Foundation. All right, and thank you, Sean. Thanks, Morgan. Have a great one. You too.